In my last video, I talked about what I believe is the right equipment for planetary observations. Now, in this second video of this series, I would like to highlight a few pieces of equipment especially well suited for observing deep sky objects. I'll keep the same recipe as last time, so we are going to look at telescopes, mounts, eyepieces and some accessories as well. So hit that like button and subscribe and let's get this video on the way. Hi, I'm Bogdan Damian and welcome to Video Observatory. Like in my last video about planetary observations, I would like to start by looking at telescopes. While all telescope types can be used for deep sky observations, there is a type that does especially well in collecting as much light information as possible. Of course, I'm talking about the Newtonian design. And here I would like to mention the trusty old Dobsonian telescope. You see, while for planetary observations, you need a long focal length to obtain higher magnifications more easily. For deep sky observations, the capacity to gather as much light as possible is much more important. This is because deep sky objects or DSOs appear very faint in the night sky. So for visual observations, you need a telescope that can capture a lot of light in real time. In other words, the telescope should have a large aperture. The larger, the better. Thanks to a simple but elegant design, the Opsonian telescopes can achieve apertures of well beyond 12 inches. In case of custom-made models built by amateur astronomers, the mirror size can even go to 30 inches and beyond. I think the biggest one is now being constructed in California, USA and has a diameter of 70 inches. But don't worry, you don't need such a monster to be able to observe deep sky objects. Smaller sizes will do just fine. Here you only need to take a couple of things into consideration when shopping for a Dobsonian telescope. Aside from the standard budget questions, you need to think about transportation and storing. And with this, I mean, ask yourself, where will you keep the telescope? How will you assemble it if necessary? And how will you get it to your usual observing spot? These are all important questions as Dobsonian telescopes can get big and heavy real fast if you go up in size. So remember, the best telescope is the one you use most often. It doesn't matter if the telescope has an amazing light gathering capacity if it sits unused in the shed. So better get a smaller one that you can use as often as possible. In my opinion, the best overall option would be an 8 inch dub, like the Skyliner 200 classic dub from Skywatcher, for example. Its aperture is wide enough to offer some amazing views of countless DSOs whilst being light and compact enough so that you can take it almost anywhere with you. And you can get all of these for a very reasonable price compared to other telescope types with the same aperture size. I own a 12 inch dub and it's almost too heavy and bulky to take outside to my front yard. Any heavier and I would need a permanent spot outside for the telescope. So transporting it to a more remote observing location is out of the question, at least for me. So keep these thoughts in mind when shopping for a Dobsonian telescope. Now let's talk about the mount of the telescope. If you decide that a telescope with an aperture of 8 inches is enough for you, then you could either get one with a Dobsonian design, which comes with an alt azimuth base, or you could opt for a telescope with a slightly shorter optical tube that sits on an equatorial mount. In which case, you could take a look at the Explorer 200P from Skywatcher. There is also the possibility to get a go-to enabled equatorial mount. This combined with a Newtonian telescope can get a bit expensive, however. So keep this in mind as well. If, however, a Dobsonian telescope is your choice, then you pretty much 
don't have any other option than just to go with an alt azimuth base. There is nothing wrong with an alt azimuth base. It's just that for Dobsonians, you typically don't have the option to go for an equatorial design. You will have to build one yourself if you feel that you need one. But luckily, there are some pretty nice designs on the internet. You just need to go and look for them. To improve the navigation, you could also go for an alt azimuth base with a go to functionality. It will cost you a bit more, but it will make finding dim objects in the night sky so much easier. In my opinion, an 8 inch dob with go to functionality, like the Skyliner FlexTube Go To from Skywatcher, is a great choice for deep sky observations. Such a setup will serve you well for years to come. All right, let's talk about eyepieces. As mentioned earlier, for observing DSOs, you don't need a lot of magnification. So we need to look at medium and low power eyepieces. Here, a focal length of 17 to 35 millimeters should be great. Keep in mind that the longer the focal length, the brighter the view through the eyepiece becomes. Since we are trying here to observe a much bigger area of the night sky than in the case of planetary observations, the apparent field of view is also an important characteristic that should definitely be taken into consideration when shopping for an eyepiece. The apparent field of view is measured in degrees and is directly responsible for how much area of the sky can be seen without moving the telescope. So anything above 68, 70 degrees would make a lot of sense for observing DSOs. When looking for eyepieces with wide apparent field of views, it's also important to pay attention to the flatness of the field of view. A flatter field of view will always look nicer and will lead to a more immersive experience. Also, and more important than the flatness of the field of view, is its sharpness. And here I don't mean that only the center part needs to be sharp, but rather the whole field of view right up to the edge. It doesn't really help to have a wide apparent field of view if it isn't sharp all the way to the edge. This is also a nice metric to measure the quality of an eyepiece. While a lot of the low power eyepieces out there are capable of offering 70 and 80 degree wide apparent field of views, only a few of them can do that and have a sharp and flat field of view at the same time. Some of my favorite low power eyepieces that in my opinion are worth trying out are the Swan series from Omegon for the budget option, the 82 degree series from Explore Scientific as a very good mid range option and the Nagler series from Teleview for the premium option. Aside from the seeing conditions present on the observing night, the factor with arguably the biggest negative impact on the views of the night sky is light pollution. So trying to reduce the negative effects of overly light polluted skies is always a good idea. Ideally, you could simply go off to a remote location outside the city, but this isn't always an option in which case using astronomical filters might be a good idea. Using filters for visual observations can definitely help reduce the negative effects of light pollution. Even though more and more street lamps get converted to use energy efficient LEDs for illumination, there are still a lot of sodium and mercury vapor lamps out there and the wavelength of the light from these lamps can be blocked by filters. In general, narrowband filters, the one that allow hydrogen beta and oxygen 3 emissions in the blue-green spectrum to pass through, whilst blocking hydrogen alpha and light from sodium and mercury vapor lamps, are good all-round light pollution or nebula filters for visual observations. Also good in bringing out very faint details in deep sky objects are UHC or ultra high contrast filters. 
They work by blocking some orange and yellow light, typically responsive for light pollution, allowing your eyes to make out details that otherwise would have been hidden. If you are more experienced, then you could try improving your deep sky observations by using other accessories as well. For example, using a comma corrector in a fast reflector telescope with an f-ratio lower than f5 will significantly improve the sharpness and flatness of the field of view, especially around the edges. This is because the lower the focal ratio is, the stronger the chromatic aberrations are going to be for this type of telescopes. This is where the stars appear more and more elongated the further they are from the center of the field of view. Around the edges, they look like little comets pointing towards the center of the field of view. The cause for this effect is the curvature of the primary mirror. So using a comma corrector to mitigate this effect might be worth considering. There are other ways to improve the views of DSOs. For example, you could build yourself a death left eyepiece shade to block any stray light reaching your eyes while observing. This will allow your eyes to observe in almost perfect darkness. Or you could consider flocking your reflector telescope by applying black velour material on the inside of the optical tube. This will considerably reduce unwanted reflections inside the optical tube, resulting in improved brightness and contrast. I have a separate video about such improvements for Newtonian telescopes, which I encourage you to check out. I will leave a link in the description below. Observing deep sky objects perhaps requires a bit more knowledge than with planetary observations, but it can be very rewarding as well. And if you haven't done so already, you should definitely try it out the next time you go outside with your telescope. This was only a short list of items that in my opinion have the biggest impact on deep sky observations. Now I'm curious to see what your setup for observing DSOs is like. Let me know in the comments below. Alright, that's been it. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please like and subscribe. If you have questions or feedback, then please leave a comment and I will get back to you. Thanks for watching and catch you guys in the next video.